Hi, my name is Pastor Daniel. I'm so excited you're taking an opportunity to watch this sermon. We believe that any time we open the Word of God, that we have an opportunity to be changed because the Bible is the actual live Word of our Heavenly Father. And we hope that this impacts you in a positive way. A quick word of caution, and that is that this sermon that you're about to watch is by no means uh, the church. It's not a substitute for a church. It's not a substitute for a pastor in your life. The church is not a building. The church is the body of Christ, a group of believers doing life together, worshiping and pursuing Jesus together. In no way should this be any sort of primary discipleship in your life, and in no way should this replace the pastor that somewhere God has called to shepherd you. We hope sincerely that you're part of a local church somewhere. And if you're not, I want to encourage you to go find a local church to be part of, because for all of the ups and downs and messiness of the local church, the Bible calls it the bride of Christ. It is the hope of the world. And you need to be part of one because it'll help. If you don't know where or how to find a local church, we'd love to help. You can simply go to our website and email us at hello at resurrect.church, and we'll do our best to plug you in. We appreciate your time. We hope that this supplementary discipleship impacts you in a positive way. We believe the Bible has a profound impact on us when we allow God to speak to us. Thanks. You know, uh, as we were doing uh, kind of our mic checks and all that this morning, I noticed for the first time, I saw Nathan Mayer holding a kid upside down. I thought, hey, that looks fun. (laughs) I wonder if it's his kid though. I don't know. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, We are going to be finishing this morning the short series that we've been doing out of Romans 12. Uh, called Things Get Real. And so I'm going to invite you to go in your Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 12. And we're going to be looking in just a moment at verses 9 through 21. And we're going to call this How to Live for Jesus. Um, Before we do that, though, I found a couple of pictures on Google Images this week. And so I asked Rachel if she would go ahead and put these in. And so you'll notice on the screens Two pictures. Now the deal is, these pictures are pretty much taken at the same location. One picture, you'll notice, is a kayak, all right? Uh, I don't like kayaks, because kayaks tend to put me in the water for no good reason. But I know there's people who like kayaks, and there's a guy taking a photo on his kayak, uh, enjoying this beautiful lake, and then the other picture, no lake, No water, no kayak. The deal is, the pictures were taken almost in the exact same location because both pictures are Death Valley. Yeah, Death Valley, the place that has the highest recorded temperature on this planet 110 years ago, 134 degrees Fahrenheit, gets, on average, about two inches of rainfall a year, and actually will go decades without rain. But over this last year, there's been a once a millennium event where a whole bunch of rain came down in Death Valley and created what they're calling Manly Lake. And by the way, if you wanna see it, you better hurry, because it's drying up. (laughs) But I saw that picture and I thought, you know, that's, illustrates just how things can change so quickly in the physical world around us. But even more, there's a greater change that happens whenever someone accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. 
But it's not just a temporary physical change. It's literally a change for all of eternity. So before I get into our passage, let me just briefly touch on what happens when someone accepts Jesus into their life. Well, a whole lot of things happen, but for time's sake, I'm just gonna very quickly mention three things. Number one, they become renewed and regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Now, the term that Jesus used for this was born from above or born again. But it's described, for example, in Titus chapter three, verses four and five, which says this. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. That's being born from above or born again. Secondly, when someone becomes a Christian, they have passed over permanently from spiritual death to spiritual life. And this is actually described by Jesus himself. The Lord said in John chapter five, verse 24, very truly I tell you, now whenever Jesus says something like that, literally the phrase he uses in the Greek language was amen, amen. In other words, it means listen up. Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes in him who has sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Now, the key phrase there, crossed over. Because the Lord there means that we permanently change status. We were in a state of spiritual death, eternally separated from God. Now we're in a stage of eternal life, even though we still live in a physical body for now, but eventually when this body ends, we transition immediately into our eventual eternal life, and that never, ever ends, okay? It's just like flipping on a light switch, but now the switch stays on forever, okay? The third fact, what happens when we come to Jesus let me get to my notes, sorry. Somebody who comes to Jesus, they have become something new, a child of God. Literally, we are adopted into God's very family, and the proof of that adoption is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So that's what happens when somebody becomes a Christian. But how are we supposed to live for Jesus after we become a Christian? I mean, it's great when we become a Christian, it's like we're a brand new toddler for God. Can you imagine though, if we decided over in our classrooms in our Sunday school wing, we decided, okay, we're just gonna let the toddlers roam free. They're in charge of the place. Yeah, we can all imagine. We've all seen toddlers. We've all, you know, yeah, bless you. Your toddler is wonderful, but we're not gonna allow your toddler to run the church. So God very carefully explains to us how we go about living for Jesus. And that's what Romans chapter 12, verses nine to 21 is all about, all right? How to live for Jesus after we have come to Jesus. So the main idea of this message is simply this. Living for Jesus upends, in a very good way, every area of our lives. Now, I appreciate Kate making the comment as uh, the different people are sharing about vision. She was the one that said, you know, that she goes to the gunnery range and, and does a lot of shooting. Of course she does. Her grandpa owns the gunnery range, okay? But, you know, one of the things that people like to shoot off if they're into guns is shotguns, okay? Uh, this is gonna be like a shotgun, okay? 
because there are so many different things packed into these verses, I cannot possibly get to all of them, all right? So I'm gonna hit you guys with the parts that hit me. How's that? Okay? All right. Now, let's just review real quickly a couple of things in our past messages. messages sorry. First of all, Pastor Daniel, a couple of weeks ago, told us and taught us through Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, and that, those verses dealt with being dedicated to Jesus. Last week, we looked at Romans chapter 12, verses three through eight. Those verses dealt with how to serve Jesus. Key word there was ministry, all right? And we learned that we are saved to serve, all right? This message gets down to the nitty gritty of how we live for Jesus, all right? This kind of teaching that Paul is giving us here, they actually have a technical word for it back in Paul's time. It's called a paranasis. I know, you didn't think a graduate from North High School could use a word like that, but there it is. <laughs> a paranasis is solid moral teaching based on earlier teaching that is loosely organized. For example, the book of James, that's a paranasis. Lots of excellent moral teaching loosely organized. And the deal is the book of James as well as what Paul writes here in Romans 12, a lot of this comes from the Lord's what's called the Sermon on the Mount, all right? Matthew chapter five over to Matthew chapter seven, okay? Now, by the way, I need to mention this too. None of what Paul is saying here can be lived out apart from the presence of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. If we try to do any of this in our own strength, forget it. That's why Jesus told his disciples and he told us as well in Matthew chapter, excuse me, John chapter 15 verses four and five, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do what? You got it. That's also why Paul wrote Galatians 5, 25, and there he said, since we walk by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So it's only by God's strength, God's ability that we can do any of this, and we have to remember that, okay? All right. Message outline, just two ways to kind of organize what Paul is telling us here. Again, the main idea is living for Jesus First part of that, if we're gonna live for Jesus, we follow new rules with each other, okay? That's uh, verses nine through 13, and then we skip over to verses 15 to 17, all right? That's the rules. By the way, that's also the shotgun, okay? Because there's lots of things listed there that we do not have time to get to every one of them. The second part, living for Jesus, means we follow a new strategy with our opponents. And you will very quickly discover, if you haven't already, and probably most of us have, that when it comes to the fact that we are walking for Jesus, not everybody is gonna be thrilled and think that's hunky-dory, all right? They're gonna be enemies, not just spiritual enemies, but also people of flesh and blood that are not gonna like how God is working in our lives, all right? So, let's go ahead and read Romans 12, verses nine to 13, and then also verses 15 and 17. Here's what Paul wrote. Let love be genuine. Some of our Bibles say they're without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, hold fast or cling to the good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Contribute to the saints and seek to show hospitality. Now we're jumping over to verse 15. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Okay, first thing we gotta realize with all of these different things that Paul is telling us, he writes them all 
in what we call the perfect, or excuse me, the present tense. Meaning that these are things that we do and we keep on doing them, all right? Now, let's just focus a bit, first of all, on verse nine. Because there's three guidelines that Paul gives there just in that first verse that kind of helps us to understand the things that he's saying here. First of all, first thing we're supposed to do in the list is we show real or genuine love. No hypocrisy. You know what's an example of hypocrisy? What Judas did to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas, will you betray the Son of Man with a friend's kiss? See, that's the sign that Judas arranged with the people that were coming to arrest Jesus. That's how he would identify Jesus, by greeting Jesus as a close friend. And Jesus knew exactly what Judas was up to. That's hypocrisy. Biblical love, the term that's most often used to describe it in the New Testament is agape. It appears 75 times in Paul's letters alone. Agape love is a mindset. It's a choice of our will. It's the same love that God demonstrated for us. Agape love is a committed covenant love that loves even if the other party does not deserve the love because it's a choice of the will. Loving fellow Christians demonstrates that we really love God. That's why the apostle Paul wrote this. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this is the commandment we have from him. Whoever loves God must also love his brother. That's the first thing. Second thing in verse nine, abhor evil. That word translated in the ESV, abhor, it's a very, very strong Greek word. It it only appears here in the New Testament. It means to detest something, to absolutely loathe it. It's like eating liver and onions. Now, if you like liver and onions, I'll pray for you. I don't. My father did, but I never ever smelled it being cooked in the house because my mom told him when they got married, if you're gonna eat that stuff, you go eat it someplace else. You don't bring it around here. Now, my dear daughter, very, very smart person. She must take that after her mom, not me. But she's really smart and She has a background training in animal science besides the current field she's studying in. And when she was studying animal science, she dissected all kinds of critters, okay? She'd have students that would get woozy in the dissection room as she was cutting open who knows what. But bless her heart, two kinds of critters that Kathleen absolutely cannot stand, that she absolutely detests, are spiders and crabs. And the kind of feeling that she has for those kind of critters and the kind of feeling that I have for liver and onions, that's abhorrence. Now, I'm kind of making you giggle a bit and that's fine, but there is a very important point here and we need to catch it. There's an important distinction between detesting evil and loving the people that are committing the evil. And too often, people out there in the world around us have thought, well, a Christian is somebody who doesn't just hate what I do, they also hate who I am. And part of that is a misconception, but sadly, at times there have been some truth to that misconception. So we have to make very, very clear 
that we love the person, we just do not necessarily accept what they're doing. Because by the way, love is not tolerance. All right? Third thing, hold fast to what is good. Hold fast, you can also translate that cling. It's the same word that Jesus used of the relationship between a husband and wife in Matthew 19, 5, that they cling to one another, they leave the households that they came from, and they now have this new commitment, and they are stuck together. Okay? That's how we're supposed to be to whatever is good. So, let me ask this to all of us. What are we clinging to? What are we focused on? See, Paul, he wrote this in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there be any moral excellence and anything is praiseworthy, dwell, cling to these things. When I first started watching pro football on TV, I was in high school, and my first team that I dearly loved, and I had kind of had a love-hate relationship with him, not hate like we talked about, okay? Different way. Was the Oakland Raiders. I heard that, Don. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> but you know, they were fun to watch back in the 70s, all right? When they won a couple of Super Bowls and John Madden was their head coach. And one of the guys that was fun to watch was a receiver that they had called Fred Blitnikoff. Old Fred is still around, but the joke was, was that Fred, the one reason why he was such a good receiver is he had his hands all lathered up with stickum. I don't know if it was true or not, but it was a great story. And by the way, the joke was he didn't just use stickum on his hands, he had it all over his uniform. So that if his quarterback, Kenny Stabler, threw a pass, and if it was in Fred's general direction, even if he couldn't get with his hands, he just kind of maneuvered his body in the way, and maybe the ball would hit on his helmet and stick. And then all he had to do was reach down, take it, and run. Are we clinging like that to the good? Because how we can tell that is by the choices we make. What we read, what we look at, what we listen to, all of those things affect how we live for Jesus. So we abhor the evil and we hold fast to the good. Now, there's so many things that Paul mentions in the next several verses that I'm gonna have to just be selective, okay? But moving on to verse 10, if you notice there, it says, Paul wrote, outdo one another in showing love. That can also be translated, honor others more than yourself. Now, honoring, of course, in our time is a big deal, but guys, back in the ancient world, believe it or not, it was an even bigger deal because they lived very much in an honor versus shame culture. You did not do anything to undermine your own honor. If you did, you would then receive shame and you got rid of that shame even if you had to destroy an enemy to do it. But Paul takes that idea of honor and he says, wait a minute, don't be concerned about your honor. Be concerned about honoring and esteeming another brother or sister in Christ. Because the gospel is never focused upon us, ultimately it focuses upon others. That's why Paul wrote, Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, seeking your own honor, but count others more significant than yourself. The way we can check ourselves in this is, are we actively seeking whatever is good for somebody else 
regardless of whether or not we get the glory. Verse 11, Paul writes there, to be fervent in spirit. Another way to translate that, be fervent in spirit, capital S, meaning the Holy Spirit. To be fervent means to be aglow, okay? So we're like little shining lights for Jesus. Also, it means that we're right hot for Jesus because it can also be translated boiling over like a pot. Now, there's a guy in the New Testament, his name was Apollos, and according to Acts 18.25, this was true about him. He was fervent, he was boiling over, he was aglow with Jesus, and by the way, he was this way even before he knew the full truth about Jesus. And once two Christians came alongside him and explained about Jesus more fully, can you imagine how much more aglow he came on? And uh, the thing about that, about being fervent or aglow for the Lord, is that it can be even stronger when we're going through hard times. Case in point, uh, go with me for just a moment over to Acts chapter four, verses 19 to, excuse me, verses 29 to 32. To set the context, the early Christians had just been told, specifically Peter and John, do not tell anybody else anything else about Jesus. Do not talk about what you call this gospel anymore. So Peter and John and the whole church came together and they prayed, beginning at verse 29 of Acts 4. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all what? That's fervency. While you stretch out your hand to heal with signs and wonders performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word with all boldness. Notice, boldness at the beginning, boldness at the end. We're not talking about something we manufacture in our own flesh. This is something that only comes, first of all, from the Spirit as he works a change in us. That's fervency. That's being excited about the, what the Lord is doing. Verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Contributing to the needs of the saints, that's koinonia. Many of us have probably heard that word before. It literally means having all things in common. It's something the early Christians were good at. If somebody had a need, other folks came alongside to help them in that need. That's what the body does. But what's really cool in that verse, verse 13, is where Paul writes, seeking to show hospitality. Hospitality, it's actually two words in the Greek language. It's love for strangers, mashed together, all right? And literally what he wrote was pursue, pursue hospitality. In other words, we aggressively but gently seek opportunities to open up our lives and our homes to others because of our love for Jesus. Can you imagine how this would happen at our church if we really practiced this? You know, somebody comes up to our church, it's the first time they've ever been there, they're kind of looking around, they're not really sure of themselves, and they're walking around, and we spot them. And we yell out, we have a visitor! They're mine! They're coming to my house! Stay away. I've got them. Obviously not. But you get the idea. Are you willing to open up your life to somebody else? 
to see it warts and all. We have a group that meets over our house every week, and Linda and I, we do our best to clean the place up, but every time our, our group shows up Sunday afternoons, I'll see the dust bunnies on the floor. I'll see something that hasn't been put away that we overlooked, we're just kind of used to it. But you know what, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we need to practice hospitality. And by the way, again, we're not just simply talking about within our homes. We're talking about within our lives, okay? And the thing we have to remember as we do this is that we also are serving Jesus. That's why Jesus himself said this, whoever receives you receives me. Whoever receives me receives him, that's the Father, who sent me. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is my disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Pursue hospitality. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep. Sadly, sometimes it can be easier to weep with someone than to rejoice with someone because of a little thing called envy or jealousy. I've told, with, told you guys before that in the past, for many years at the old church, I could not do this kind of ministry, all right, which... Preaching is a stretch for me. I'm much more comfortable teaching, but I still like to preach. But then other people would have the opportunity to preach, whether at the old church or whether at some other church, and in their excitement of being able to do this kind of ministry, they would come and share it with me. Hey, Vance, I get to preach over here. I get to talk about this. And my attitude would be, that's wonderful. I'm so happy for you. Was I happy? Not really. And God dealt with me about that. And by the way, you don't want to go in dog, God's doghouse when he deals with you about this, okay? It's like the old story of there was a monk living in the desert of Egypt somewhere around the 400 AD. And this monk was being tempted by all these demons. And the demons could not phase the desert monk at all. They would whisper horrible things in his ear and terrible things. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? And the monk was just, mm. and finally, the devil himself showed up. And the demons complained to their master, saying, Master, we cannot phase this guy. We've tried everything. He's just peaceful and serene. And the devil says, Don't worry, I got this. And the devil comes alongside the monk and whispers into his ear, your brother just became bishop of Alexandria. And that serene expression on the monk's face faded into anger and bitterness. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We weep with those who weep. Verse 16, four commands given right after another in verse 16. The first one, living in harmony. By the way, in those four commands, you can't really translate this real well in English, but what Paul wrote was four uses of that word thinking. The same word that we talked about last Sunday about how important our thoughts are. The first thing we have to do in terms of our thoughts is we have to live in harmony. Literally, you could translate that, think alike with each other. Paraphrase, don't be an uppity snob. <laughs> Either with what we are willing to do or whom we are willing to hang out with. Because where Paul says there, be willing to do humble tasks, you could also translate that, be willing to hang out with humble people. 
Great example of this. The Lord just called him home a couple months ago, but for many, many years here in town, there was a wonderful pastor, and some of us know him, named Milt Cole. Milt Cole, a long time, was working with the ministry Youth for Christ, and when he left that, he became the pastor of what was then called Fruitvale Community Church. Now it's River Lakes Church. But decades ago, Milt was scheduled to preach at his church, and he was greeting folks in the foyer at their old church location, and a new family came to the church, and the new family had a little, little kid, either a baby, probably a toddler, and the kid did what kids sometimes do, and the kid got sick in the foyer. Broom. Milt immediately sprang into action. The family felt so bad He went up to them, he talked to them, he reassured them, he went and got some stuff, he cleaned up the mess, took care of it, made sure the family was situated, made sure they understood that they loved him, they were happy to be there. The family came in, sat down, the service started, and then at the appropriate time, Milk got up to preach, and the family said later, you know, this is such an awesome church, even the janitors get up and preach. All right, the last command that Paul gives there in that verse, I'm in the wrong place, let me go back. As he says in verse 16, never be wise in your own eyes. How can we avoid being wise in our own thinking? Well, frankly, we need to focus on another viewpoint. That's why we're told in Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 8, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge, literally know him. And he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. In other words, if we change our focus and focus upon the Lord, then it becomes possible never to be wise in our own sight. All right, moving on. We've talked about all these different things we need to do to live for Jesus. The second thing we need to do to live for Jesus is we need to follow a new strategy with our opponents, okay? So let's read now the remaining verses. Verse 15, and then we'll go right over to verses 17 to 21. Here it is. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, Jesus warned us that his followers, his disciples, would be attacked for following him. For example, he said this in Matthew 5, 11, and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then the night before he was betrayed, in that upper room, he told his disciples this, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. You could also translate that worship to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. Now, verse 21, the last verse is the key. That's the guiding principle here. Overcome evil 
with good. By the way, that's the heart of our salvation. Paul in Romans 5, 8, he wrote this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, in that while we were still sinners, evil, Christ died for us. There's three actions that are all tied together in this section of scripture. If we're gonna overcome evil with good, there's three things we have to do, and we have to keep doing them, all right? Again, it's present tense. First of all, we seek to bless. That's verse 15. Then we act honorably before everyone, not just before fellow Christians, but as much as we can before everyone. Third, We try to be a peacemaker as much as possible, live peaceably with everyone. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, they shall be called the sons of God. Now, will this always work? No. But if we do What Paul is writing here, we are being obedient to what the Lord expects. And by the way, is it hard? Yes. But let me just remind all of us that one time in Luke 17, Jesus challenged his disciples to be willing to forgive as often as necessary. And the disciples said in response, Lord, increase our faith because they knew they didn't have the strength within themselves to do what Jesus just said. And Jesus responded back and he said, look, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, this big, you could say to that mountain, do this and it would do it. In other words, Jesus was saying, it's not a matter of your faith, it's not a matter of your strength, it's a matter of your obedience. If you do what I'm telling you, the Lord is telling us, I will give you the strength. I will bless you because you did what I expected you to do. And the other side is this. We leave justice in God's hands. Some of us remember what happened back in 2006, quite a few years ago, at a place called West Nickel Mines School. That was the one room Amish schoolhouse where a gunman broke in and shot and killed six of these little Amish girls before turning the gun on himself. The reason why the story made headlines around the world and all the news stations covered it is the reaction afterwards because the Amish community chose to forgive. They actually reached out to that family and extended love and forgiveness to them. There was even the father of that man who shot and killed the children cried for an hour in the arms arms of one of the fathers whose daughter was killed, sobbing over what his son was do- had done, but they chose to forgive because they recognized justice is in God's hands. It's like what the question that Abraham asked before the Lord, shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? Here's the question that we have to deal with. Are we willing to trust God and literally give place? Give place to the wrath of God so that he can handle the situation or are we gonna get in the way and mess things up because that's what we do. Case in point, sometimes read 1 Samuel chapter 25 when David was on his way before he became king to really screw something up and he got stopped by a godly woman and then God took care of the situation. 
I like what Everett Harrison wrote on this, a New Testament scholar. He said this, trust him to take care of the situation. He will not bungle. He will not be too lenient or too severe. By the way, that's faith. Trusting God. But there is one other thing we have to do. Did you notice the thing about the burning coals? That's Proverbs chapter 25, verses 21 and 22. What's that? Remember the principle. Overcome evil with what? So the point is, we keep loving those people. We keep practicing what Jesus told us to do with the idea that eventually, and what frequently does happen, is those folks begin to feel bad, they begin to feel guilty, they begin to feel remorse for what they're doing. Can it happen? Yeah. It happened in the case of David. Saul came twice to kill him, both times. Saul was in David's hands. David could have killed him easily. David didn't. Saul found out later that he was this close to dying and David did not act. And both times, Saul confessed and told David, you are in the right, I'm in the wrong. It also happened in the case of the Apostle Paul's life. See, Paul, before he became a Christian, was there at the side of men who were killing a guy named Stephen. He witnessed that. And he heard Stephen praying for his murderers, saying, Lord, forgive them. Do not hold this sin against them. Saul never forgot. And decades later, as he was giving his testimony, he again relayed that story. My, one of my small groups were reading a book on forgiveness written by a guy named Louis Schmeeds. We need to understand this, guys. We don't forgive to, ne to help the other person. We forgive by God's strength and help to heal ourselves. So we leave justice in God's hands. And we keep overcoming evil with good. So, Conclusion, the main point again of the sermon was living for Jesus upends in a very good way every area of our lives. Now, as we wind things up, I would invite you to please stand with me. I'd like to give us all a challenge. And the challenge is this. There are so many commands in here but I would encourage you to pick out one that the Lord has been dealing with you about. What's one area of your life that you need Jesus to change you? Are you willing to seek him out and obey him? Now, if it would help to drive that home, I'd invite you to come forward. If you want to pray with one of our church leaders, that's fine. If you'd rather kneel here at the steps, that's fine too. But don't leave here without doing business with Jesus. Is there something he's working on you about that you need to come to him? So as Rachel sings, you come.